All right, so now that we've covered the basic structures of the brain and the overview of the brain, let's talk about the holes in your head, literally holes in your head. And these are called ventricles. And these are fluid-filled spaces that if we were to look through the brain, we would see something that looks like this shape here, these kind of ram's horn shape. And these are what we call lateral ventricles here because we have one in each hemisphere. If we were to take the brain and sagittal section and look at it and look into the hemisphere, in this case I have the right hemisphere, if we were to look inside it, you would see the space. And the two ventricles, the lateral ventricles on either side, are separated by a thin wall of material called the septum pellucidum, which in sagittal view we will see is like a thin wall of material that separates the two ventricles, the two lateral ventricles. So you have a lateral ventricle in each hemisphere. Neither one of them is numbered. However, they both drain into a third ventricle here via interventricular foramina or foramina of Monroe. And this third ventricle is actually numbered. And we have a fourth ventricle as well, which is down a little bit lower. So if we look at the brain in sagittal view, we would see the fourth ventricle here. Between this area here, we have the pons and the medulla oblongata here. And we have the cerebellum here. And we would see this kind of kite shape in between the two called the fourth ventricle. And we can look at it in a lateral view as well. So here we can see the two lateral views the lateral ventricles, one in the left and one in the right hemisphere. We've got our third ventricle, which is going to be right between the two thalami. And then we're going to have what we call our cerebral aqueduct, which is this little passageway right here that leads into our fourth ventricle, which is basically on the back wall of the pons and the medulla oblongata. And posterior to that, we have the cerebellum. So these spaces are very important because they contain a fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. And cerebrospinal fluid has several functions, not the least of which is for protection against knocks and bangs. So what we will find is that the cerebrospinal fluid is made in the ventricles. And it will then be circulated out to coverings of the brain called meninges. We also have coverings of the spine called meninges as well. And this is a three-layered structure that has a space within it for this cerebrospinal fluid to circulate. And we will see that both the cerebrum and the spinal cord have these meninges. And so we have the cerebral meninges, we have the spinal meninges, and these meninges cover the brain and the spinal cord. In fact, they cover the entire central nervous system. And the, the cranial meninges, I should say, because they cover all the structures within the cranium. The cranial meninges cover the entire brain and cerebellum and the structures of the brain at the lower end, like the medulla oblongata as well, and then they will become continuous with the spinal meninges. And we'll look at the structure of the meninges in just a little bit, but we should realize that you see these little holes right here. These are called the lateral apertures. There's a left and right lateral aperture, and there's a median aperture in the fourth ventricle. And the cerebrospinal fluid, as it's made in the ventricles, is then going to be circulated out to the meninges, which are going to surround the brain and the spinal cord. And we'll look at the structure of the meninges in just a little bit. But let's first talk about some of the supporting structures of the, around the brain, I should say. So for example, the brain sits in the cranium, which is bone. So as you recall from our cranial vault, we have our frontal bone or parietal bones, we have our occipital bone, temporal bone, and so forth. So these are the bones of the cranium, and they're going to be like the armor plate within which the brain sits. And this is very important because any physical thing like a rock hitting your head would be very damaging to the tissue if it contacted the tissue directly. But instead, we have this nice armor plate in our cranium. And right under the armor plate, we have the cranial meninges, which are our fluid-filled spaces that are between the cranium and the surface of the brain. And these cranial meninges also, as we said, contain cerebrospinal fluid that is circulated out to them from the ventricles. And the cere cerebrospinal fluid is made within the ventricles and circulated out to the cranial and spinal meninges. And basically what that's going to do is that's going to suspend the entire central nervous system in a fluid-filled medium. So it's like putting the 
central nervous system in a vat of fluid. So it's really cushioned. And it takes the weight off of it, basically reduces the weight, and it reduces the amount of impact that it's going to feel so that it can be sloshed around in the spaces within the cranium and within the spinal cord without getting a lot of side to side lateral or anterior posterior banging around. So we've got these nice shock absorbing fluids in there. They're kind of buffering the brain and the spinal cord from hard knocks. So these aren't the only physical protection systems of the brain and spinal cord either. So we've got to think about the fact that we also have a chemical isolation in the blood brain barrier, which we talked about a little bit before. Now, both of these systems are really put in place by some of our glial cells. So if you remember our ependymal cells, they're going to be lining our ventricles. And in certain areas of the ventricles called the choroid plexus, we will find very specialized ependymal cells that will make the cerebrospinal fluid. Now to maintain the blood brain barrier, we have our astrocytes. And as you probably recall from previous discussions, we have capillaries in the brain and in the central nervous system. And these capillaries, as we know, are very small blood vessels. And the endothelium of the capillaries is that simple squamous epithelium that basically has the junctions just between the cells. And that's how stuff can get in and out of the endothelium there in that capillary. So a lot of things, molecules can squeeze out through the interstices of the endothelial cells. And these cells are held together with junctions. And those junctions are fairly tight and create a fairly impermeable barrier. But there are some things that can go through fairly freely. Now, things in general circulation, we don't want in the brain. So we have this special sort of extra layer around the capillaries that's provided by these end feet of the astrocytes. So remember we talked before about the astrocytic end feet, and one of the things that they do is they wrap around these capillaries and they will secrete chemicals that tighten those junctions between the endothelial cells and make them less permeable. So this is going to help us keep things out of the brain parenchyma or tissue that we don't want getting in there. For example, like we talked about earlier, things like glutamate has to be strictly controlled how much of it is in the brain. And since glutamate is just an amino acid, it can be circulating in our systemic circulation after we eat a meal rich in protein. So we want to keep it out of the brain because glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So we don't want too much of it in the brain that could then cause the tissues to become overactive. Another thing that astrocytes do is they're going to absorb, recycle neurotransmitters and other things, and they're going to regulate ion concentrations and neurotransmitter concentrations and the like very carefully so that the neural tissue itself does not get overexcited or does not get burdened by a overabundance of certain things that could be toxic. All right, so let's move out to the cranial meninges. And we have three layers of the meninges. We have an outer layer called the dura mater. And dura just means heart. And mater means mother. So this is the hard mother, and this is going to protect your brain. This is going to be fused to the inner layer of the cranium. So we have this dura mater that's fused to the osseous tissue of the cranium. And right under the dura mater, we're going to have the arachnoid mater, so-called because it looks like a spider web inside. An arachnid is just a term for a spider or something with eight legs, really. Scorpions also are arachnids. But the arachnoid mater is so-called because it has a spider web appearance. And there's a lot of space in there for fluid to percolate through. And this is where the cerebrospinal fluid will actually be circulating. Below that, we have a very, very fine layer called pia mater, which is attached directly to the cortex of the brain. And the pia mater will follow all the indentions, all the gyri and sulci, and basically follow these sulci into the brain. And so it follows the, the curves of the outer cortex and is held in place by also, once again, astrocytes. And again, the cranial meninges are going to be continuous with the spinal meninges, and they're both going to receive cerebrospinal fluid from those ventricles that we looked at a little bit earlier. 
So let's have a closer look. Here we have the dura mater, and here we have it fused. We have a periosteal layer that's going to be fused directly to the cranium. In certain areas of the dura mater, we're going to have a sinus. And the sinus is basically going to collect blood up from circulation. So after it's circulated through the brain, is going to collect the blood that has been circulated through the brain and given up its oxygen and picked up carbon dioxide. And it's going to take that blood and dump it into the internal jugular veins, which is going to return it, of course, to venous circulation and back to the heart for reoxygenation. So if we look at the dura mater very closely, we will see that it has this periosteal layer when you have a sinus here, and then we have the meningeal layer, which is right next to the arachnoid mater. Now, one thing to note, this diagram here indicates a subdural space. In a healthy person, you will not see a subdural space. A subdural space will only appear if there's been a pathology, severe dehydration. Sometimes if you have a very hard hit to the head, you can have bleeding in, in between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater, and it creates what we call a subdural hematoma. And this is basically a clot of blood that can be quite dangerous because as it grows, it can push down on this tissue. And you could imagine that if it starts pushing on the tissue of the brain and compressing it, then you're going to lose function under where it's pressing. And not only that, but that pressure can be transmitted all the way down into the brainstem, where we have a lot of autonomic functions like breathing and heart rate. And so eventually what can happen is the person can die just because failure of doing basic things like breathing and having their heartbeat. So hopefully we're not going to see a subdural space in a living human being. It's not that uncommon to see it in cadavers, which are dehydrated. So a lot of times this tissue will just start to delaminate as the, the dead tissue is dehydrated and the space will appear. Right below that, we have the arachnoid mater. And you see it's kind of spiderweb like in appearance. And so all of these little things here are called trabeculi. Trabeculum means beam. Once again, we'll encounter this term many times in anatomy. We'll see it again in other structures. We saw the trabeculi in bone, for example. And that's this kind of this beam like structure here. Now, in between all of these little trabeculi, we have space. And this space is where the cerebrospinal fluid circulates. So the arachnoid matter will then be directly fused to the pia mater underneath it, which will follow all the inventions, the gyri and the sulci of the cortex itself. Now, we have in the dura mater, we've already seen sort of the dural sinuses that can appear, but we also have one other feature. We have some folds that we're going to have where the dura covers the, the brain. It's basically going to fold in in places. So for example, right along what we call the longitudinal fissure, which is the division between the two hemispheres of the brain. So if we were to put the brain back together, we would have this fissure or space between the two hemispheres called the longitudinal fissure, well, the dura will actually fold into that space and it will create a what we call a fox cerebri, which is a division between the two hemispheres. And the reason it's called fox is because fox is the Latin word for sickle. And if you remember what a sickle is, it's something that you use to cut wheat into large bundles and bundle it up into fasciculi. And so a Falk cerebri is basically this sickle-shaped infolding of the dura between the two hemispheres. We also have the tentorium cerebelli, which is going to be a piece of dura mater that is infolded between the cerebrum and the cerebellum, and it's called the tentorium cerebelli because it creates kind of a tent-like structure between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. And finally, we will have a fine piece of dura here, a smaller piece that folds in and separates the two cerebellar hemispheres called the fox cerebelli. Again, it's kind of sickle-shaped, so anatomists just call it the Latin word for sickle. So here we see a picture of it right here. Here is our fox cerebri right here, and it's going to divide the two hemispheres and go in between the two hemispheres, the left and right hemispheres of the brain. And then we're going to have the tentorium cerebelli, which is going to separate 
the cerebrum from the cerebellum, and it's going to be found through here. And then we're going to have the Falx cerebelli, which is here, which is going to separate the two halves of the cerebellum. You'll notice that the dural sinuses are contained within these infoldings. So you'll see this superior sagittal sinus up here. This is basically a venous sinus. This is where deoxygenated blood is going to drain. And we also have an inferior sagittal sinus here, which will then drain into a transverse sagittal sinus. And eventually all of these will empty out into the internal jugular veins. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the blood supply to the brain. We've got some very important arteries, and you've probably heard of them. You've probably heard of the internal carotid arteries. You probably know that the carotid artery, the common carotid artery, runs up the side of your neck. And this is the one that you often feel to feel your pulse. And close to the top here, it will branch into an internal carotid artery, which will supply the brain, and an external carotid artery, which will supply structures outside the brain. And then we have the vertebral arteries. And if you remember back to our cervical vertebrae, those transverse vertebral foramina, as I pointed out in lab, these are for the vertebral arteries. And the vertebral arteries are also very important arteries that are going to bring oxygenated blood to the brain. And once the blood gets to the brain via these two major sets of vessels, the internal carotid arteries and the vertebral arteries, they will then diverge into multiple arteries that will supply the brain, various areas of the brain, and then that blood, when it has been deoxygenated and used, will then flow into our dural sinuses, which will then flow into the internal, internal jugular veins. All right, now let's talk about the cerebrospinal fluid. We've already mentioned the fact that it basically holds the brain and the spinal cord in the suspended medium, so it's going to provide shock absorption. And it's going to hold the brain, kind of hold the brain in place so that it doesn't get slammed around inside the structures that the hard structures like your vertebral column and your brain that are holding it in place. So the other thing is that it does is it will transport uh, nutrients, chemical messengers and waste products. So there's going to be a lot of stuff going on in the brain. It's going to create a lot of waste. There will be hormones, chemical messengers messengers, neurotransmitters, and the like. There will be ions, all kinds of things that we will find within the cerebrospinal fluid. And one thing that's very important about it that's only recently been discovered is that cerebrospinal fluid will, at night when you're asleep, in deep sleep, will wash through the brain in waves. And it'll pick up all kinds of metabolic waste and detritus that has accumulated in the brain during the day, and kind of wash it out. So it's a good way to clean the brain. It's kind of like the washing system of the brain as well as it is a supportive system. So cerebrospinal fluid is made in what we call the choroid plexus. And the choroid plexus is going to be in the floor of the lateral ventricles. We will see it will be all along in the floor of the lateral ventricles. It will also be within the roof of the third ventricle and the roof of the fourth ventricle as we'll see a little bit later on. And it's going to make about 500 milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid a day. However, only about 125 to 150 milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid will actually be in circulation at any given point. And then the rest of it will be returned to venous circulation via something within the meninges that we'll look at a little bit later called arachnoid granulations. So let's have a look once again, remind ourselves of our ependymal cells that are lining the ventricles. And the choroid plexus has a very special type of ependymal cells that's going to be close to blood vessels, so close to capillaries. And it's actually going to produce the cerebrospinal fluid in the choroid plexus. These ependymal cells are going to produce the cerebrospinal fluid by taking the fluid portion of plasma, changing its composition a little bit, changing the ionic composition, and then it's going to put that into circulation in the cerebrospinal fluid. And also, you'll notice that these ependymal cells have either villi or in some cases cilia. So the villi will increase surface area for absorption 
and secretion. So we can secrete cerebrospinal fluid into the ventricles while at the same time removing waste products from the cerebral ventricles, the, sorry, the cerebral ventricles. And then we can put those, that waste materials into circulation to get rid of them. Another thing that we will see is we need to move this stuff around too. So some ependymal cells will have cilia in them. And as we know, cilia are specialized for moving fluids over a luminal surface. So in this case, the cilia will be helping to circulate that cerebrospinal fluid. Here we have some actual ependymal cells that are in the central canal of the spinal cord. And as you recall, the ventricles of the brain are continuous with the central canal of the spinal cord. So here we have our choroid plexus. Here we see it in the floor of the lateral ventricles, the roof of the third ventricle, and the roof of the fourth ventricle. And as we have noted earlier, we have two lateral apertures, a left and right lateral apertures, via which the cerebrospinal fluid can exit the ventricle here, the fourth ventricle, and flow into the meninges. And we also have the uh, median aperture, there's a median aperture as well, that will also allow for the circulation of the cerebrospinal fluid into the meninges. So we can also see that we've got complete circulation, both within the cranial and the spinal meninges, and these meninges are continuous with one another. And so as you can see here, we've got this fluid-filled shock-absorbing covering for the brain and the spinal cord. Now, how the cerebrospinal fluid is made, as we've said, is in the choroid plexus. Then it circulates out through these apertures in the fourth ventricle into the meninges. But then it's going to have to be recovered somehow. So if we look here, you see these little things right here? They're sticking up. These are called arachnoid granulations, sometimes arachnoid villi. And they look like little cauliflower kind of sticking up into that superior sagittal sinus. And what they're going to do is they're going to dump excess cerebrospinal fluid into venous circulation by dumping them into that superior sagittal sinus, which as we know is returning deoxygenated blood into the, eventually it'll empty into the internal jugular vein, which eventually will get back to the heart to be reoxygenated. All right, so we've talked about the meninges and we've talked about the ventricles. Let's talk about the fact that we have our blood-brain barrier and we're going to have four places where the blood-brain barrier is somewhat compromised. That is, there's going to be a break in the blood-brain barrier. And the reason for this, as we'll see a little bit later, is that we're going to have areas of the brain that are important for getting hormones or other signaling molecules out to the rest of the body. And to do this, they have to be able to put hormones, sometimes they're proteins, peptides, sometimes they can be amino acid derivatives. But in any case, these molecules have to be put into circulation. And these molecules would be too large to get through the blood-brain barrier. So as we've talked about a little bit earlier, the hypothalamus is going to be the neuroendocrine axis. And so it's going to be producing hormones, and it will also be controlling the actions of the pituitary gland, which is one of the major endocrine organs that we'll talk about later when we get into the endocrine system. So the hypothalamus has to have a way, has to have a means of releasing some of these hormones into circulation. And so we're going to have some of those hormones be directly targeted at the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland also is going to have to release hormones. So we're going to see in the posterior part of the pituitary gland, we see that the pituitary gland has two major lobes, an anterior and a posterior, and we're going to see that it releases two hormones into circulation. And both of these two hormones, antidiuretic hormone, which is also called vasopressin, and oxytocin, and we'll learn about their function a little bit later, these will be released from the posterior pituitary and they will actually be produced by neurons within the hypothalamus and will have an axonal transport of these hormones into the posterior lobe of the pituitary, and then they will be released. But instead of being released on synapses, they will be released directly into circulation. 
Finally, we have our pineal gland, which as you probably remember from the previous lecture, is going to be regulating circadian rhythms. So it's going to be making something called melatonin. And melatonin is a hormone that is going to help us regulate our sleep-wake cycles, our diurnal cycles, our changes with our in behavior with the change in light, spring, summer, fall, that kind of thing. So the pineal gland is also very important and it too will be secreting hormones. So it has to have a little bit of a break in the blood-brain barrier so that we can get these molecules outside of the brain and into circulation. Finally, we have the choroid plexus and this is where the ependymal cells are going to have to get some things from the blood and Go back to this diagram here. So we're going to get plasma from the blood, and then we're going to have to be able to get other things from the blood. And the ependymal cells can then act as the filter here. And the ependymal cells can then figure out what it needs to put into the cerebrospinal fluid and take only that component of blood that it needs. And then it can add the additional things like certain ions and other things so that the composition of cerebrospinal fluid is actually quite different from blood plasma. All right, so now that we've covered the meninges and we've covered the, the ventricles, we can talk a little bit more about the blood supply to the brain. And we've already hit upon the major arteries and the major veins, but let's talk a little bit about what happens if something blocks or occludes blood flow to the brain. You've probably all heard of a stroke, also known as a cerebrovascular accident. And this is where you have some kind of lack of blood flow to the brain. And, of course, that's going to deprive the tissues of oxygen and nutrients, and so they'll die. So a lot of times what you hear of is you hear of something called hemorrhagic strokes, which are a little bit rarer than ischemic strokes, but hemorrhagic strokes occur when there is an actual break or dissection in one of these arteries. And typically what will happen is the artery will somehow be broken and there'll be leaking blood into the brain tissue. And this is not good because not only does downstream do downstream structures not receive blood, but then you have all this stuff in the blood that is toxic to the brain and the thing that the blood-brain barrier is supposed to be protecting the brain from. So ischemic strokes are going to happen if something physically blocks a capillary or blocks an artery. So typically what will happen is you're going to have a chunk of stuff, usually some kind of plaque maybe that's built up in the artery, or maybe you have an embolus that's broken off from somewhere else and gotten lodged into the artery, and that's going to cut off circulation to that part of the brain. All right, so we've already talked about the blood-brain barrier. Let's talk a little bit more about it. So we've already emphasized the fact that it's going to isolate the neural tissue from general circulation simply because there are things in general circulation that would be bad for neurons like certain ions. Too much calcium can be excitotoxic. Glutamate, aspartate, these things are that are excitotoxic. There are other things in blood circulation that we don't want getting into the brain. So the blood-brain barrier basically is formed by the astrocytes wrapping their astrocytic end feet around the capillaries and secreting chemicals that are going to make those endothelial cells tighten the junctions between them. And that's going to allow for the brain to be much more picky about what gets into it. So it acts as kind of a filter. Now, we have certain things that can diffuse through very easily. As before, oxygen and carbon dioxide can diffuse freely through. Certain steroids can also diffuse through. And certain other molecules called prostaglandins can also diffuse into the brain and the spinal cord. And as we said, the astrocytes are going to be the major controlling factor here, and they're going to release chemicals that are going to control the permeability of that endothelium. And the endothelium is just a special name for that simple squamous epithelium that's going to line all blood vessels and the heart. So capillary endothelium is about the only thing that makes up a capillary, so it's very thin and it allows for the passage of things like dissolved gases and nutrients through it. Now, one of the things that we have to touch upon here is the blood-brain barrier is one of the key problems for pharmacologists who want to develop drugs 
to act on the brain. So if they're going to be developing drugs, for example, serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors that we discussed in class before, some of these, these drugs for say depression or for Parkinson's disease, they have to find a way to get these drugs across the blood brain barrier. And there are certain other things that can be problematic in that they can compromise the blood brain barrier. So for example, radiation. So ionizing radiation can compromise the blood-brain barrier. Even cell phone radiation can, can temporarily disrupt the blood-brain barrier and let things leak in there that shouldn't be in there. So the blood-brain barrier is a very important thing in that it's going to keep toxic things out of the brain and very tightly control the kind of chemicals that get in there. We also have the blood CSF barrier and to distinguish it from the blood-brain barrier, it's formed by ependymal cells, and it's going to surround the capillaries of the choroid plexus. And that's going to allow us to, going back to that, that's going to allow us to control exactly what components get put into the cerebrospinal fluid. Because remember, we're taking components of blood. We're taking components of the fluid component of blood, blood plasma, but there are certain things that we don't want in the cerebrospinal fluid and certain other ions and other things that differ from blood plasma and blood that we do want in the cerebrospinal fluid. So the ependymal cells are there to adjust the composition of the cerebrospinal fluid.